This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, retired United States Air Force Colonel Terry Scott joins us to share his thoughts on what is arguably the most capable pure fighter aircraft of all time. I'm a huge fan of the F-22, and I'm so thankful I got to fly it. It was very expensive, but in the modern world, with all the threats that are out there today, it has really proven its worth. And all that technology that we built into that truly saves lives every day. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Vincent Aiello, call sign Jello. This is episode 61. We'll get to our interview on the F-22 Raptor with Stretch Scott in a moment. But first, let's meet this week's guest co-host. Back from episode 58 on Anglico is retired United States Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel and former F-22 Raptor exchange pilot, Dave Burke. Welcome back to the show, Chip. It's good to be back, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. It's only been a couple episodes since we heard from you last. Anything new in your world? No, man, just cranking along, doing my thing. Things are uh, <laughs> kind of pretty steady these days. All right. Good to hear. Well, let's see. Uh, let's just jump right into this. Normally, we start with some announcements. We only have one today, and we'll actually save that for the end of the show. But hey, you got time for a few listener questions before we get to the interview? Yeah, absolutely. That'd be cool. Sweet. All right. So why don't we start with a phone call? Hi there, this is Dan, uh, born and raised in Maryland, but currently living in the Czech Republic. I have a question regarding the paradigms that different countries and even manufacturers of, of aircraft use when thinking about what kind of aircraft they want to create, you know, for governments, what kind of aircraft they want to ask for and employ in their air forces. Because, uh, of course, different countries will have different priorities for what they need an air force for, and they'll also have different ways of thinking about how they want to handle a fight and what kind of fights they want to get into. So, for example, if you compared the way that Russian aircraft are typically built or the way they're used by their pilots compared to American or, say, historically you know, German, Japanese, even Swedish, you'll probably find a lot of different thoughts and paradigms on the way pilots fly their aircraft and also the uh, kind of aircraft that are built and what they're used for, and what they specialize in. So if you guys had any kind of input on the things you know, if you've rubbed shoulders with uh, other pilots, Things you know about the kind of paradigms that they use in handling their aircraft or how they're built, that would be super cool to know. Thanks very much, and have a great day. All right, Chip, so we're going to put most of these questions to you today. What do you think from Dan from Czech Republic on his questions about paradigms on aircraft design? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, and it's a good question. Kind of looking at it historically, uh, I think for the United States and for all countries, you know, we, we were making airplanes that we thought met the expectations and the needs for how we thought we were going to fight in the future. What you've probably seen from the United States, and, and, and its allies too, but mostly the United States, certainly in the last several decades, is a recognition that it's really hard to predict exactly what warfare is going to look like. So even in our primary fighters, we try to make them as, as flexible and sort of adjustable as possible. We make them multi-role and try to give them as many different attributes as possible. Even things like the F-22 we're going to talk about, which in theory is sort of designed to be one mission aircraft, really does a lot of different things. Probably most noteworthy for me when, when he's asking that question is what the Russian threat was like, the former Soviet threat when you and I were flying, uh, you know, up at Top Gun when the mm -hmm. MiG-29, a really short range airplane, you know, kind of limited capacity, limited payload, limited range, but really good at that kind of near intercept mission and how far they've evolved with, you know, the Su-35 and aircraft like that, much farther range, much broader re weapons capabilities, much more flexible to even go on ships, to go in austere environments. Uh, and I think that's just a reflection of what people have come to realize in these countries building aircraft is it's really hard to predict the future. And so building airplanes that have the uh, capacity to fill a lot of different roles is what a lot of countries are moving towards. And now what you can see everybody's moving towards is stealth, which is pretty mm -hmm. ironic given the fact that we're going to talk about the Raptor today. 
Uh, I think following uh, America's lead in China to build aircraft that can fight in that fifth gen arena, uh, which they realize that anything they've built up until now, if it comes up against a Raptor and F-35, is totally obsolete. And those aircraft, no matter how good they are, uh, are not good enough to stay in the fight against a fifth gen machine. Yeah. So that evolution has been pretty cool. Yeah, the standard evolution of warfare, right? I mean, we began back with sticks and stones and here we are with this technology. <laughs> but yeah, I would add to that the difference, I think, in some of the mentality of the design, like back in the Soviet era is, as we talked about on the MiG-29 episode last week, was that the mindset was that, hey, this guy, this pilot, I don't know if it was a question of trust or whatever, but it's like, he's just an extension of somebody on the ground who has an idea of what's going on, and he's going to do exactly yeah. what we tell him to do. And in the West... That mindset of, yeah, that decentralized versus centralized command, yeah, you're absolutely right. And in the West, it's always been more of a, hey, you're a fighter pilot, you're going to go out and do what needs to be done, we're going to give you the best tools, as you said, to do that, but but you know you have better situational awareness out in the cockpit than we do back here in some command centers. So I think that has really changed. I don't see too many aircraft anymore that are being designed where it's kind of an, just an extension of just go out and do what we tell you, look where we tell you, and if you see somebody, shoot them kind of thing. So Yeah, I think they've come to realize that that simply just doesn't work as <laughs> dynamic as air combat mm -hmm. is. To not allow the pilots to make their own decisions in real time is kind of a suicide mission these days. And they recognize that decentralized command is the only way for warfare to work. You know, that's that's been talked about for a millennial. Uh, and it's 100% true in aviation as well. So you got to train your people and build a machine that allows them to make decisions autonomously. And centralized command and centralized decision making is, uh, is not effective for warfare. And it's not effective for airplanes either. Awesome. All right, let's move on. We have an email from Elliot from Brighton in the UK. He writes on occasion. And he asks, when we talk about the weight of bombs, like a 500 or 1,000 pound bomb, what exactly does this measure? As far as I can see, this could be just the weight of the explosives, the combined weight of the explosives in the casing, the weight of the explosive casing, as well as guidance systems, such as the JDAM kit. And if the weight of the guidance kit is not factored in, does the added weight have a noticeable impact on payload? So for example, would a jet able to carry four Mark 82s only be able to carry three GBU 38s, which are the 500 pound JDAM, because of the added weight from the JDAM kit. So, what do you think of that one, Chip? Yeah, good question. So, to kind of keep it simple, when you're talking about the weight of the bomb, so a Mark 82 would be a 500 pound bomb body, a Mark 84 would be 2,000 pound bomb, and there's a bunch of different variations. They're actually really talking about the weapon itself. And it's, you know, roughly, so a Mark 84 would be roughly 2,000 pound class weapon. Now, that 2,000 pounds could be a little bit lighter if there was nothing on it, but more than likely be a little bit heavier, maybe 100 or so pounds heavier with different types of fins and different types of guidance systems, maybe antennas. And the fins and fuse combination, the front and the back, and the slight variations go on that might actually add weight to that. In reality, the amount of explosive that's in the weapon, I think, is, is maybe even a little bit less than half. So if you had a 2,000-pound bomb, you'd have roughly maybe 900 pounds of explosive on the inside of that, the part that actually detonates. And the rest is the weight of everything that goes on around it to include the casing and the fins and the fuses. So if I had, let's say, I wanted to carry four of the Mark 80 series weapons, I was going to carry four 2,000 pounders. It wouldn't really matter for my aircraft if it was a, just, you know, a dumb bomb that just had kind of a nose cone and a fin or a full-up weapon that had, you know, GPS guidance capability and fins. The bomb would be a little bit heavier, but on an order of, you know, maybe 100 pounds or so, and I'd still be able to carry that weight on that station or across the aircraft itself. Uh, it's a good question. Yeah. Totally agree. I think the only thing I would add is that while the weight on takeoff doesn't matter, on bring back, if you're at the carrier, of course, it's just total weight. And that's a measure yeah, of yeah, yeah. everything you're carrying and your fuel. And so to your point, 100%. yeah, if you were, for whatever reason, bringing back some JDAM instead of some general purpose bombs that weigh a little bit less than the JDAM, then you might have to sacrifice a little bit of fuel. And then the only other thing I would say is, man, I don't know if you remember, Chip, but I think a GBU-24, which is theoretically a 2,000-pound class weapon, but because of the size of the guidance kit and the fins, was something like 2,300 pounds. You remember that? Yeah, and actually, the restriction on that wasn't even so much the weight, but the fin kit that was on there, you couldn't carry two of those side by side, uh, and just the physical restrictions of that. And yeah, you know, things have evolved, too. That, that nuance there is a really great point. The bombs that we're carrying today, they've made so many variations and made so many adjustments that they actually don't look or even act much like their predecessors did back in the day when we were just carrying those dumb bombs around. Excellent. All right, let's take another phone call. Hello, Mr. Aiello. My name is Nico Davis. I'm calling you from Buffalo, New York. 
First and foremost, I'd like to say that I really enjoy the podcast. I'm listening from episode one right on through. I just finished the home front episode with the spouses, which I thought was great. And I'll be sure to listen to that episode again with my girlfriend, because I think she'll gather great information from that. My question is this. I'm an NFL veteran and now aspiring fighter pilot. And one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot in the application process is the reality that I may not be assigned a fighter. Now, I don't want to sound spoiled or entitled, but I know that you had said in an earlier episode that, you know, if you're being honest, you would have been a little bit disappointed or probably a little more than a little bit disappointed if you did not get a fighter. Well, I feel the same exact way. So I was wondering if you had any advice or maybe if you could touch on how a aspiring fighter pilot can reconcile with the reality that they may not get assigned a fighter and kind of what things you can kind of keep in mind mentally and emotionally to help through that process. Again, thank you so much for the podcast. The information is great. I really love it, really enjoy it, and have a good day. Thank you for your service. All right, Chip, Nico, former NFL player. He's pulling a Pat Tillman. I love it. Chip, how do we reconcile not getting a fighter in flight school? And by the way, I'll tell you, this comes up all the time in the podcast. Yeah. Well, first, let me tell Nico uh, a little gratitude. Appreciate the fact that he's had, obviously, a very successful life and a successful career, and he's interested in finding a way to serve, which is awesome, man. So totally, really appreciate that, Nico. And and I would say, you know, to connect to your question, no matter what you do, the fact that you're willing to put on that uniform there, it means a lot, man. And you're a role model. Uh, And referencing Pat Tillman, you know, those type of sacrifices are not unnoticed, man. That's pretty cool. Look, the reality is, is that not everybody gets to do the things they want to do. Just remember the first word in there is service and you're in service to the country and the needs of the service is always going to outweigh your individual desires. The secret recipe to getting what you want in flight school to getting fighters is a finish at the top of your class. But even then, there's no guarantee. You don't sign a piece of paper that says, if you finish number one, we will automatically give what you want. Now that Typically happens, and if you're the first in the top of your class, you get your first choice. But remember, you're going to get a series of orders throughout your career, and those orders are going to be is what is in the best interest of the service and in the nation, and you're going to serve in a way that they deem fit. That's something you should know well in advance. And I'd echo what Jello has alluded to in the past. I'd be completely honest. If I didn't get fighters, if I didn't get hornets, I would have been disappointed. There's no question about that. But I wanted to you know, stress the idea though that I served to be a Marine first and to be a fighter pilot second. And so if you end up not getting what you want, what you have to realize is that you've got a different mission than what you expected. That's going to happen throughout your career. You're going to get different missions than what you expected. The best thing you can do is fully commit to that in the exact same way that you would have had you gotten your first choice. So the mindset needs to be is you're here to serve, You're here to do what the country and the service needs you to do. And you're going to do that to the best of your ability. If you don't get what you want, then you need to change your mindset and recognize you have a new mission uh, and promote that mission as every bit as important as it was. If it was the mission you had dreamed of the entire time and be a good leader, be a good role model for the people around you and commit and devote yourself to not just the job that you're doing, but the people you're doing it with. Uh, And you're going to find your opportunities to serve uh, in a lot of different capacities. So thanks for what you're doing, man. And be prepared to serve in any way that, that the opportunity presents itself. Amen. Well, you can see, listeners, why Chip is such a in-demand speaker. You know, he's obviously got the ability to motivate folks, and that was pretty awesome. Of course, it is a little ironic, Chip, coming from you, because I think some <laughs> would argue you've had a pretty, oh, yes. I don't know, uh, <laughs> pretty good I've been lucky, career. Man. Yeah, that's right. But now I totally agree with you, and it's funny because I've actually been invited to come to UCLA, my alma mater, for their fall ball, celebrating the Navy and the Marine Corps' birthdays, and speak at their dinner, and that basically is exactly what I intend to talk about, because they just had their their selection and a lot of them got what they wanted, but some of them didn't. And man, that's going to carry through all the way in your career. There's always going to be little setbacks. There's always going to be things that go your way and things that don't. And it's how you handle them that really, yeah. I think, demonstrates your metal. But thanks for the point out there, uh, Chip, as far as you know, me mentioning it on the show. And I will tell you, Frank Regadio, our H60 guest. Uh, let's see, who else was there? JLo, our C2 guest. And then Niles, our air intercept communication guest. All those guys flew something other than fighters. And I asked them on the show, like, you know, how was that? What happened? 
And they all said, you know what? I loved where I ended up being. Yeah. I think, you know, if you want to get really deep and philosophical here, call it God, call it karma, call it whatever you want. Every one of us has our own path. And Chip, your path and my path were not a lot alike. In some ways they were, but they weren't the same path. And it's not right for me to be jealous of yours and you shouldn't be jealous of mine. It's just your path and my path. And for some people, it goes through jets. For other people, it goes through helicopters or E2s or whatever, or not even flight school. You might get washed out. And so that's right. you've got to come to grips with that. The earlier you do it, the better you handle it, the better off you'll be. Yeah. And I think that's true throughout life. Uh, and it's a life lesson for all of us, for our kids, for the people around us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I agree with you completely, man. I think that's spot on. All right. Final question is from Jaden Shaw in Alberta, Canada. He said, I would love it if you'd explain the difference between blue water operations and green slash brown water operations and how they affect naval aviation procedures. Chip, I had to write back Jaden and say, can you explain green and brown? Because I don't know if you ever use those, but I always just use blue water or not. But I think what he wants to know is CV ops, so aircraft carrier operations when you're blue water or divert ops, I would call it. You know what? It's funny because I took it as what he's talking about is the... um the amphibious fleet there when you're talking about brown water operations uh, in the littorals oh, okay. for LHAs and things like that. And, you know, what we traditionally would be uh, the Marine Expeditionary Unit on the smaller carriers and bringing in Harrier CH-53s. And now you're talking V-22 Ospreys and F-35B. So I will answer it like that. And I hope his question is uh, being answered the way that he was hoping, because the way I read it is, and I've heard that term, you know, the brown water Navy is sort of that traditional Marine Corps operation, which is kind of interesting because I never did that as a Marine. I was a big deck carrier guy on a regular traditional carrier air wing on a conventional carrier. So I never spent time on our smaller carriers like the WASP uh, and the newer classes like the America class. But I think what he's really talking about is how in the blue water operations on a big deck carrier, you know, that's the carrier air wing deployed and that carrier air wing embarks aboard a carrier, you know, a nuclear class uh, carrier. And that is part of a carrier strike group. And that carrier strike group, uh, you know, brings an incredible amount of firepower, not just the air wing itself, but that carrier strike group that CSG brings destroyers and cruisers and all sorts of other powerful naval capability. Mm -hmm. And that operates autonomously. What's unique about the brown water side of things when you're talking about the amphibious capability, now you're talking about a smaller air wing, if you want to refer, they don't call it an air wing, but the aircraft component, the air combat element, we call it the ACE, is certainly smaller than what you'd see on a large carrier. But what it also brings is a GCE, a ground combat element, and a logistics element as well. And so what this smaller uh, strike group, the ARG, the amphibious readiness group, is capable of doing is actually forming a beachhead and doing an amphibious assault and working inside those much harder to reach littoral regions, not that blue water, but on that brown water side. And they've got air support, ground support, and logistics support to conduct operations that are actually self-sustaining for several days, if not longer, until a much larger force like the full-blown Air Force or Army comes in and, and can take over. Those operations can be somewhat similar, but the demands are very different at times. Uh, and the Marine Corps spends a lot of time prepping with the Navy on that amphibious readiness group and that amphibious capability of what I think he's referring to as the brown water Navy there. Yeah, and we talked about that a little bit with Wang Chung, our uh, MAGTAF guest, and that was, I think, last September of 18, episode 26 or so. Yep. Awesome. So we covered a little bit of that. But yeah, I mean, I guess it makes sense, right, Chip, that you would never have deployed on one of those because the F-18 doesn't. So you would have had to have been a, That's right. a Harrier guy, or I guess later you flew the B, F-35B, but... I never deployed with the B, but yeah, the F-35B just finished his first deployment on the 13th MU just this last summer on the USS America uh, and conducted operations and had a MU attached cool. with it. It's pretty neat to see what they're able to do with the ACE and the GCE and logistics element together. Right. It's a pretty impressive fighting force. And then the only other thing I would add is that in case his question was about either blue water ops for a carrier or divert ops, that it really comes down to you need to show up to land your aircraft with enough fuel to do something. And I know that's deliberately yeah. vague, but the point is you're either going to have a pass or two or three, depending on how proficient the air wing is, and then go to the tanker or divert. And the fuel you need yep. to get into the tanker or the fuel you need to divert is what starts that whole math equation. And then you add a certain number of pounds per pass, whether it's day or night, and that 
dictates what you arrive on the ball with. And then if you make it great, you just land with extra fuel. If you don't, you have options because options are key when you are out at sea in a carrier where you can't just go to a different <laughs> runway or divert to a different airfield like you can at Los Angeles or somewhere else. So Yeah. And I'll just add to the one sure. thing that since we're talking about is the psychological component of being blue water operations. Oh, and I know you remember mm -hmm. it. I remember it well too. That first morning you wake up and the nearest divert is 950 <laughs> miles away. And you're like, okay, well, there's no divert options anymore. And what that means means being in an aircraft knowing that you do no you no longer have an option to go somewhere else. You know, we do all the prep work out at uh, you know off the Pacific coast there and if things don't go well, you head back to Miramar or North mm -hmm. Island and it's not that big of a deal. But real true blue water operations psychologically there is no other place to go. Yeah. And if you're in a high lot hornet where you had a heavy aircraft, you know, the fuel difference between landing and going to the tanker is pretty small. So you got to be really on your game mm -hmm. and it requires a lot of professionalism and capability of the pilots, the ship and the LSOs bringing those guys aboard. And it's pretty impressive what uh, our pilots are able to do, even in those difficult environments like uh, true blue water ops. So that's an excellent point. Cause I do remember the first time as a nugget, we were blue water, like no kidding. There's, <laughs> there's nowhere else to go. You're landing on the carrier. There is no, uh, or you're yeah. the silk, <laughs> totally, man. man. So, yep. Good dude. All right. Well, Hey, why don't we get to our feature interview? Now you had a chance to listen to it, Chip. Uh, what did you think of the interview before we go to it with stretch? Yeah, so cool, man. I mean, obviously, stretch, uh, long history of flying the F 15C, uh, you know, our, our preeminent air supremacy fighter there that for decades, and then have it be replaced by the F 22 and get to transition into that and fly that thing for years. I know he had a great time. <laughs> and it certainly reminded me of all the uh, my time flying the Raptor, too, you know, almost four years in that machine and, and watching that thing come on line and, uh, and evolve the way that it did. I really liked listening to Stretch's explanations and just the experiences he had in the Raptor. It's just an incredible airplane, and, and I really enjoyed hearing him talk about it. No doubt. Well, let's let Stretch take it away then. All right, today the Fighter Pilot Podcast is back in Las Vegas, and we are in fact in the very same studio with the uh, Harrier guest, Magua, before, but now we've got Stretch. How's it going, bud? It's going good, Jello. Excellent. Well, let me introduce you, if I may, retired United States Air Force Colonel Terry Scott, call sign Stretch. Now, Magua's last name was Scott. Is this a family business over here? I wish it was, <laughs> but uh, we're brothers, but from a different mother. Okay, fantastic. Well, I only mention that because his interview helped me set up this interview. You guys are both over at Draken. We'll get to that in a moment, but now you've flown a lot of airplanes, as I understand. But we're going to talk, really, arguably, the true fighter of all. I mean, this is what the Fighter Pilot Podcast was designed to talk about, the F-22 Raptor. So before that, let's learn about Stretch. Where are you from? Where did you go to school? What did you do in the military? And what are you doing now? I'm originally from Arkansas, okay. and I grew up there. What uh, part? My wife's from? Uh, between Hot Springs and Benton, Arkansas. Okay, sure. Yeah, my wife's okay. from Northwest. My father was a career Air Force pilot as well. So mm -hmm. he flew P-51s in World War II, T-6s okay. in Korea. And then ended up retiring at Little Rock Air Force Base. And that's how we ended up in Arkansas. Okay. So I grew up there, went to college at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, graduated from Henderson State University in Arkadelphia through the aviation program there. And then I applied for OTS and pilot training, got accepted. Then I graduated out of my pilot training class. I got my choice of fighters. I chose an F-15 to Eglin mm -hmm. Air Force Base in Florida as my first assignment. After that, I went to Saudi Arabia to help them set up their flying training unit, then back to uh, Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida to uh, the NFTUIP there, and then uh, went from there, multiple assignments, flying the F-15, and ended up flying the F-15 for 20 straight years. Wow. And then I transitioned to the F-22 in uh, 2009, and I flew it four years before I retired in 2014. My last assignment was at uh, Hickam Air Force Base in uh, Hawaii, where I was the vice wing commander flying F-22s there. Holy smokes. You come from a dynasty of uh, fighter pilots, P-51, yeah. F-15, and F-22, all in two generations. Yes. Now you're flying for Draken here in Las Vegas? I am. I'm the uh, Nellis Detachment Commander for Draken International. I fly both the A-4 and the O-159 here, okay. uh, doing adversary support in support of the 57th Wing and 57th Adversary Tactics Group okay. here at Nellis. So our Harrier guest, Magua, works for you? Well, well we work together. Okay. Okay, he and I, I call it the Scott Brothers. He runs all of the Navy Marine Corps ops, and I do basically all the Air Force ops. All right. Everything we do, we tag team. And well, 
we worked together sense. on everything. Sure. His background was Marine Corps. Your background was Air Force. That makes sense. It's a great mix. Well, golly, I, we could go into so many different tangents here, but I think let's focus on the F-22. And I'm really excited for the show. I hope the listeners are too, because I don't know that much about it. So I look forward to learning something. But I reference this aircraft quite frequently because when we get to performance, I always talk about the F-18 being amazingly nimble at slow speeds but lacking, if you will, some of the energy addition that the F-16 enjoys. But the F-16, did you ever have a chance to fly that? I did not fly okay. the F-16. Well, the F-16, you can pull all you want. When you get to 25 Alpha, you're done. And so I've always guessed that the F-22 is like the best of both of those. And so when we get to performance here in a moment, uh, we'll talk about it. But the other thing that's cool to me about this, unless you tell me I'm wrong in a moment, is it's kind of the last pure fighter, right? Like the F-35 was kind of designed to do everything and arguably not a, really a pure dogfighter like the F-22, but... That so, is true. Yeah. It sounds to me like you put those two together and the F-22 is probably going to have the advantage, but again, the F-35 was designed to do other things. Yeah, so the F-22, when mm -hmm. it was originally designed, right. it was designed to be a replacement for the F-15C fleet, mm -hmm. the A through C fleet. And originally it was going to buy 750 of them. Yes. We ended up with 181. Just due to budgetary can, uh, Yeah, we can thank the War on Terror and I think Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld for both of those, right? Some of those, I'll just yeah. leave that as <laughs> it is. It's the ones we got what we got, right. and they're good. And your point about maneuverability, so if I'll dive into that, if you sure, want to talk a little bit about that. Sure, let's just go right to that. that. So one of the design features that they really got correct on the F-22 is the flight controls. Okay. They are phenomenal. You can do anything you want with the flight controls. It's actually the original flight control input in the Dash 1 was you may fly this airplane with reckless abandon. <laughs> it actually said that in the operator's manual. I'm sure someone up high took We've that We've changed out. <laughs> that a little bit now, but it, truly you can fly it like, wow. like that. For example, the rudders are not tied together. The ailerons and flaperons are not tied together. Wow. For example, if you're pulling a high G turn or high alpha uh, maneuver, and you want to, you know, for example, have the airplane, you know, what you would traditionally do is kick and do a rudder turn. Mm -hmm. Well, we call it a pedal turn, but the reality is you're asking the flight controls for yaw. Now, what it may do is kick the left rudder out left, the right one out right, and pull up the right leading edge flap, and it gives you all the yaw <laughs> you want based on what you request. Wow. So it is a yaw request that you're asking right. for. Because it's a very well-designed flight control system. Well, and I've, on the past on the show, called it fly-by-vote. So in other There words, is some voting. Yeah, you're saying, hey, voting. I want to go yawing left in your example, and it's going to give you a lot of different things to do that. But you get the And if the it, it will keep you in control and wow. give you all the yaw you want. No kidding. Other things about the flight control system is the thrust vectoring is incorporated into the stick. So you don't actually have to think about anything huh. when, you, when you want thrust vectoring. So basically above 275 knots, mm -hmm. it's going to give you a G command. Okay. So when you pull on the stick, it's going to go nine Gs. That's the limit. It's going to okay. give you that and give you as much turn rate as it can. Below 275 knots, if you go full aft stick, it's going to give you the max pitch rate up to 40 degrees a second. Wow. So it will turn slow speed yeah. very well. I have to tell you, my one and only time seeing one of these visually when I was in an F-18 was up at uh, Northern Edge in Alaska. And the scenario was heavy electronic attack. I was red air. This guy was part of the blue package. And apparently they thought they'd shot us, but turns out their shot didn't count because of the scenario. I rolled into what I thought was kind of a perch setup. You're familiar, right? Like an offensive oh, very well. perch. Yeah. And I thought from all the times I've ever done that with another F-18 or an F-16 or F-14, whatever, I'd never seen an F-22 in that. I thought, okay, I have an idea of how this should go. And the next thing I knew, we're having a 180 degree out pass. Okay. And I'll tell you, Stretch, it actually, in a sense, gave me a form of vertigo because I thought to myself, how on earth did that just happen? Here I am at this guy's seven o'clock approaching to about a mile. And the next thing I know, we're having a 180 degree out left to left pass. Of course, at that point, he shot me in the face as, we, as he turns in. But to this day, there are only a handful of memories. Of course, my CPU up in the brain is only so capable, but there's only a handful of things I remember from 3,800 hours and 25 years. But that's one of them. I still I have no idea. Well, having come from a fourth gen background to a fifth gen background, it's eye watering. Is it? When you're sitting yeah, in, it's even it, better. Yeah, huh? yeah. Even when I'm flying <laughs> offensive against another Raptor, that airplane's eye watering oh, when man. it starts maneuvering visually. Yeah. A couple of good stories. Sure. You know, learning to fly the airplane. So when I checked out in the Raptor, 
uh, very little time because I was an older dude in the squad. How many hours and, did you have in the Eagle at that point? By oh, the about 3,500. Holy cow. So I went from the high time active duty uh -huh. F-15 pilot Dang. to the lowest non-qualified dude in the Raptor. <laughs> so my first mission, one of my first missions, I'll, I'll never forget this. So I take off out of Elmendorf and we go up into the red flag range and I'm late joining the fight. And so the vol's over. All right. And so I show up at the end of the vol and there's a tanker there because I was supposed to meet the tanker and then go fight. So I show up there and then F-16 from one of the aggressors shows up. Uh-oh. <laughs> and I go, hmm, how can we not miss this training opportunity? That's right. So the tanker guy just happened to say, hey, we've got a lot of gas uh, <laughs> we need to get rid of. Would you guys be able to take some gas? So I talked to this, the uh, the F-16 guy there. I wish I remember his name. Mm -hmm. His call sign was MiG-3, and I can't remember what mine was. Right. So anyway, we join up, and we do BFM. <laughs> and we're going to drop down below the tanker and fight. And we do this, and we do three full sets. Uh -huh. So what I'll kind of summarize is, on the first set, I didn't do very well because I pulled and went post-stall maneuvering all the time. Now, I would finally recognize it, get some energy back, but he was able to hold his own against me. Uh -huh. And I'm like, that shouldn't be happening. Right. Uh -huh. So the next one I did a little bit better. And then on the third one, I said, I'm going to fly this kind of like I flew the F-15 until I get a grip on what's going on. All right. So I kept my speed up on that one. I didn't mm -hmm. get below 400 knots and I just walked around the turn circle. Hmm. So I fought a rate fight versus uh -huh. a classic nose position fight. All right. So I think the moral of that story is <laughs> learning the AHC, the advanced handling characteristic features of that airplane. It took me a little bit of time. Uh -huh. And well, once you, I figured out, hey, when to expend energy, when not to, then I right. became pretty reasonably uh, sound at flying the airplane. But well, it took some time. Yeah. It took some well, practice. you had muscle memory, right? Yes. I mean, you had done the same thing in the F-15. Maybe, I, I presume you flew A's and C's, but yes. I assume they're pretty close. But you'd done the same thing for so long, you had to kind of reprogram your brain a little bit. Yes, yeah. and a lot of negative transfer. Okay. Oh, uh, all right. In how you fly the airplane. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. With switches, just everything. Mm. So it was... Uh, Really a great experience, but going from being, you know, really top yeah. to, I didn't make any mistakes in the F-15 at the end. I mean, I'm sure I made a lot right. of mistakes, but, but, you were at the but top I was pretty you know, competent, right. pretty reasonably good to being not very good at the end. It was pretty humbling to go, gosh, <laughs> how did I just, how is this yeah. 03 kicking my backside? <laughs> did you guys like, go out okay, and like tank happens. and then do it again? Oh yeah, we did uh, three full sets. On the third set, I finally yeah. got a gunshot on the third uh, set because I finally go, okay, I've got to fight this how I know how to go. fight it. So I went back and I talked to some of my instructors and I go, all right, fellas, watch my tape, watch my recording. You've sure. got to tell me what I was doing wrong. Uh -huh. And so I got the 03s you know, the young captains in the squadron to go, all right, stretch, here's where you're messing up. This is your error. This is your error. I'm like, oh my gosh. Now, are there so F-22 equivalents that. of you? Are there guys out there with 3,500 hours in this thing by now? No. A high time Raptor pilot. I've got three or four friends who are over a thousand hours. Oh, wow. And I think probably the high time guys probably got 12, 1300. Oh gosh. Okay. But I hadn't updated that recently. All so right. thousand hours in the Raptor is a very seasoned Raptor pilot. Hmm. Well, maybe it's not as, uh, to me, it feels like it's been out there a lot longer than maybe it has, but we should get to that. We should probably go through <laughs> the actual uh, outline we've got here. And I will tell you, by the way, right now, there'll be a lot of listeners that'll be upset that I didn't, instead of talking about the F-22, corral you into the F-15, because I've been promising an episode on that for a long time. So if you got any buddies that want to come on the show, let's talk about them Maybe offline. Maybe I'll come back and talk but, to Eagles. Uh, there, there you go. Well, as I recall, when we started this discussion, you said, well, I flew the F-22 most recently, so let's talk about that. That's where we'll be. So getting back to the top of the page here, the F-22, as we intimated a little bit, is really designed to replace, like you said, those teen fighters. And so it was intended to be a pure fighter, right? It's not yes. the quarterback on the back of the uh, fight telling everybody where to go. It's out there getting in the mix and fist fights. Yeah? That is a true statement. The important part of that is the problem was if we had bought all 750 that were originally planned, mm -hmm. then the F-15C would have been retired. By now. By now. But that's not the case. So what they've done and what the Air Force has done is adapted tactics. So they're now doing fighter integration as a baseline fighter unit. So you'll have four F-15s or fourth gen fighters, mm -hmm. and you'll have a couple of Raptors with them. And basically they do the standard fourth gen tactics. And when that breaks down, then the Raptors go in and take care of business there. Okay. Well, and that's not a bad thing, right? Because regardless of where we right. are to this point, here's where we are today. 
and here's the toys Uncle Sam has given us, how best use them. And it that's sounds correct. like that's what the weapon school They've, is doing, right? That is exactly okay. what they're doing. Perfect. So there's a whole phase called yeah. fighter integration to where they work with, with eagles and vipers and strike eagles all combined with fifth gen to perfect those tactics. Cool. Well, this is serendipitous, by the way, this conversation, because I really need to pick your brain some more offline. As far as this show, as I've told my listeners on episode zero, and it has been, is very Navy-centric. So we need to get an episode on the weapons school. We need to get all those other aircraft, because that's just my experience was the Navy. So sounds like you can Solid. hopefully uh, connect us with some more folks. All right. At some point, either in development or early in its career, someone started saying, hey, we need to throw some air-to-surface capability on that. Was that part of the design or just a, hey, we need to answer the mail? What was that all about? Well, I think General Jumper did that. Okay. Because I think he goes, this is a magnificent platform. Give us a background on who he was real quick. Okay, he was chief staff of the Air Force okay. at the time. All right. General John Jumper. So he pushed for, and I think his uh, ultimate objective was to ensure that the Raptor got funded and try to get more of them available. Okay. So he wanted to have a multi-role capability on top of the air-to-air -air capability. And that's where we added GPS-guided bombs. All right. And then they're going to evolve into, you know, radar mapping and multiple capacity, large capacity of carrying SDBs. Okay. Small so, diameter bombs. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of capability that has come along with the airplane. But the fundamental role is the air-to-air -air role. Gotcha. One of the early episodes, I forget the number, but it was when we were doing aircraft nomenclature and we were talking about F means fighter, A means attack. I had speculated that at one point the F-22 was going to be called the F-A-22. Do you know that? I do. Yeah, is there General any truth Jumper. To that? Yes, that okay. actually. So it was. <laughs> it came out as the F-22, mm -hmm. and then when they added the attack capability in there, they changed it to the F slash A-22. Right. And then they go, okay, folks, we were silly. We changed it back, and it's actually the F-22. We, we got that's our money. Official, and, yeah. That's our official designation, and that's what it's going right. to be. Okay, fair enough. I ended up, I think, being correct then because you were? yeah, the FAA-18, as I recall, was like two different almost requirements. And the reason it got yes. the F in the slash was like, hey, look, this one aircraft can do both, and et cetera, et cetera. So sounds like you guys did that as well. You got what you needed, and then uh, it's simpler to just call it the F-22. So, yeah. All right. So with all that being said, what is a bread and butter role for the Raptor? What does it really do well? Oh, well, off, off, I think we offensive about. <laughs> counter air in a aerial denied environment. So big time surface air threats. Big time surface air threats high numbers of fourth gen adversaries okay they can do the job there all right uh, so they can survive where fourth gen airplanes cannot due to its stealth capability and also part of its speed and, and weapons capability okay do they need like let's say it's a super intense environment but like you said advanced threats both surf to air air to air can they go out and do what they need to do autonomously or are they particularly effective with the right electronic support behind them obviously they need Air intercept control, that's not what I mean, but like, are they able to do it on their own or do they require some platforms in the background? I'm kind of thinking electronic type stuff here. They can do it autonomously. Cool. One of the things that you wouldn't want to do and let the Raptors get out there and do this job mm -hmm. first, especially in the highly contested surface to air threat, mm -hmm. keep those fourth gen fighters out of that threat until we can control the sky. Right. Then we'll take down the SAMs and then we'll go ahead and take we'll down open the door. Thing. Then we'll kick in the door. <laughs> so they're really good right. at kicking in the door. Sounds a little bit That's, like what the F-117 did night one. Yes. The and they're, storm, right? they're very good at that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you know, and you know, after I retired, I was flying a mission on the Nellis range. I know that there's stealth fighters out there, but I don't know where they're going to at, and where they're going to come from. All right. Uh, so I'm in my A4, and we're capping. We're <laughs> holding over in the west part of the range. We're waiting for GCI to give us a call to go try to target the F-22s and the B-2s. Uh -huh. And all I got, so I'm capping there after about 30 minutes after the beginning of the vol, and then all I get from the RTO is uh, Sniper 1 and Sniper 2, you're dead. And I'm like, oh, my Come God. How come? I didn't even get a commit <laughs> from GCI. And then I look up with my night vision goggles, and I look, oh, my gosh, there's a B-2 and an F-22 just flying right over. Right I had over. No clue they were there. Oh, my That's gosh. That's what that airplane brings to the fight. Oh, that is amazing. Hey, since you said it, let me ask you, because it's been in the news, Is there, do you, if you know, are there F-117s still out putzing around doing things? Are we? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Perfect. We'll have to ask someone else who uh, can weigh in on that. I don't but, know. But I'm glad you said F-22 and B-2 because here we are in Las Vegas at the end of September. Tonight, I'm not going back to San Diego. I'm actually going on to Kansas City. Tomorrow, I've got a date at Whiteman Air Force Base to go talk about the B-2. Fantastic. So it should almost 
air these episodes in sequence, but I think I'm going to save it for Bomber Month. It's like Shark Week, only different. So <laughs> anyway, so it gets out there in contested airspace. It does the job. And in a mission like that, are you thinking mostly like clearing out the air picture or also laying some warheads on the appropriate foreheads? It depends. Okay. Okay. Depends on the tasking and depends on the amount of air to air adversaries that would be out there. So there can be a mix. What they would do most likely is they would send a mixed formation guys that are dedicated with lots of air to air weapons. Okay. Okay. And they probably wouldn't be carrying any bombs. And then a certain number of guys carrying bombs going in, finding the targets and taking them out. Sure. Almost like a self escort type right. role. But for the folks, it sounds to me a little bit similar for the F 18. I mean, if you've got an air to air mindset, it's not so easy. I mean, it may sound like it to the layperson, but oh, hey, wait, while you're at it, employ this GPS guided munition. They're like, well, hold on. I got to do the mission planning. I've got There's to more have... to the story. Exactly. There's a lot so... more to the story. And it can actually be very time consuming mm-hmm. and you have to control the sky before you can do the bombing. You can't be doing both. It just takes too much time and effort yeah. to ensure your survivability to be able to do that. So for the different missions, just going off script here a little bit, for the F-22, do you guys feel... I don't say, want to say overwhelming, but are there a lot or is it just a function again of, hey, look, here's our basket of missions and we can do them all well, but we just don't want to do two at once if we don't have to kind of thing. Like in F-18, what I'm getting at is we feel like the jack of all trades, master of none. Would you say that's true for an F-22 pilot? I would not say that. I would okay. say they practice predominantly the air-to-air role. Okay. And they're going to be the masters of that. United States Air Force has asked them to be the masters of that. Right. They're the pros on the air-to-air side of the house. Okay. You know, I'd say 90% of what they do is air-to-air. Okay. And then, assuming they have control of the sky, then they can do the other stuff to gotcha. help take out the IADs, which will help pave the way for all the other fighters right. coming in. So you're not employing harm, for example, to get ahead, right? That's correct. So you're not doing close air support, generally no. speaking. Troops in if, contact. If, believe it or not, they've actually done close air support for the F-22. <laughs> okay. And actually have done very well in Syria. Oh, all right. So I've got some bros who've done some great work okay. over there. And I was shocked at the missions they were doing. And mm-hmm. I'm like, you know what? It's a fantastic weapons platform. I'm glad to see the Air Force using it like right. that. Again, to our earlier point, it's the tools we have now. Let's use them the best way. But the point I'm getting at is you don't have all these other missions like in the F-18. We do have close air support as our bread and butter. We do have harm, harpoon. Oh, by the way, every time we deploy, unlike you guys, right, you learn how to land once, you're pretty much done. I'm not trying to say I'm better. I think you're smart for that. But whenever we get ready to deploy, we spend a lot of hours going around in circles, getting ready to land on the boat. And so you guys can concentrate on those missions, sounds like. And they do. There will be a spin up. For example, the guys that went to Syria, they mm-hmm. they did a spin up for all the close air support stuff. Gotcha. So that's part of it. But primarily, their job is control of the sky. All right. So let's talk variants. We have the YF twenty two, which is of course the prototype. We don't need to talk about that. But other than that, really, it's the F twenty two A. That is correct. There are different block variants. All right. And all of the blocks, there's a, and I can't remember the exact one. I think it's up to block twenty. It could be block thirty. Beyond Block 30 and newer, they're all common. Okay. So have commonality throughout the fleet. I think the ones that, that are Block 10 and 20 cannot be modified. Infrastructure. They are. And those airplanes are being used at the flying training unit in okay. the RAG sure. uh, to teach our new pilots. But they don't have a two-seat version? There is not a two-seat version. So lots of simulators, of course. Yep. So checkouts. F- and- first ride is by yourself. <laughs> but it's not the first time you've ever flown a military aircraft. Of course. That's correct. You're, you're That's a winged correct. Air Force pilot. So, but there are O-1s right. that fly the F-22. Wow. So they'll go right out of pilot training, right into lead-in fighter training. Okay. And they'll do a little bit, I think, in the F-16 to get refueling because oh. it's a side stick. And then they'll flow into the F-22. I'll be honest with you, those kids do really well. Good. Well, at this point, they've got the system hopefully pretty well figured out. Was there ever any discussion about an F-22B? Again, the the buy got shut down pretty early on. but There originally was, but funding didn't allow it. And they go, okay, we'll just go without it. And so at this point, we have 100 and what'd you say, 78-ish? The original buy was going to be, well, it ended up being 181. 81, okay. And so they get incremental upgrades, but... Yes. uh, And at one point, they had talked about reopening the line, didn't they? But they just... There was a huge discussion about that. It has not come to fruition. So it's not going to happen. It's probably almost as expensive to try to reopen a line as it is start over. But yes, that's, of course, challenging and expensive also. So here's where then uh, we can get to the looks of the thing. Now, with the YF-22, it won against the, I believe it was the McDonnell Douglas YF-23. But when you put them side by side, they actually look very similar. And I assume that was a result of what? The statement of, hey, this is what we want. 
I think it was to meet the requirements there. Okay. So I think, and I'll have to look this up later, but I think the 23 was a Northrop. Uh, oh, not McDonnell Douglas. Okay. I don't, maybe it was a combination. After that time. Yeah. yeah. So the shape of the airplane is 90% of its capability. So to achieve the desired results in the air-to-air environment, and if you were to look at the radars that were trying to target the F-22 and F-23 in their competition, I think shape was uh, very important to sure. achieving those objectives. Okay. And part of that then gives you the capability you talked about before with its ability to do what it does. So it was designed with a lot of features for both denial, if you will, and protection, right? So yes. we don't want anyone to see us. And if they do see us, I'm going to get myself tongue tied here, but you know, we, we don't want to that's the same thing, right? So in other words, we are stealthy, but there's also some different measures to hide our signal. I don't, I, I don't know how else to put this. Uh, maybe you can save me here. So we have stealth. We have some absorbent materials. Uh, I got to be gentle here. We also kind of mask some of our IR a little bit. And I don't know. What else? What are you allowed to say? You're awfully quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be quiet on a lot of that. All right. But I will say, I think visually detecting the F-22 is also very difficult. Mm. And I think there's a lot of thought built into that as well in how the airplane is painted and how it looks and its shape and also how guys run their intercepts. Most F-22s show up at, up at the merge undetected. Undetected. And then if they are, for whatever reason, near something trying to shoot at them on, from the ground, there's some IR protection measures. And of course, this all gets into the very protected stuff. And to your point here, I've got my computer here. I'm cheating. Northrop McDonnell Douglas YF-23. Right, thank you. So anyway, all right. We were both right. Yeah, there you go. But they also have, it's not just the shape, it's the materials they use. There's coatings, which is part of the reason that when you take a panel off in maintenance, it's such a big deal, right? Like in the Navy, we're taking stuff off all the time, particularly out on the boat where we have to deal with corrosion from the salt air. But for you guys, when you take a panel off, it's kind of a big deal because when you put the panel back on, you got to treat edges and various things. It can be. Yeah. What I would say on the original F-22, as it came online, maintaining that system was very difficult. Mm -hmm. It has evolved and gotten better. And there's panels that are now, uh, that are routinely pulled off that they've modified to where they okay. they unbolt, snap in, snap them back on, you're good to go. Sure. It doesn't have to go back to the paint barn. There's been significant improvements in maintaining the, uh, the stealth capability gotcha. on the airplane. Stretch, I didn't warn you I was going to ask this, so if you want to punt, you can. Sometimes on this show, we talk about cost per flight hour, maintenance man hours per flight hour. Are those numbers you remember off the top of your head for this? Or I know those flight hours. Because you're the wing guy? But, well, because I work at Draken. Oh, okay. And uh, we know that based on the general accounting office, we know what those are. And they're very high. It's probably somewhere upwards of sixty-five dollars to $70,000 an hour to operate at F-22. Wow. How about how much maintenance uh, goes into a, an hour? I don't know that exact number. Okay. The dollar value that put into there is all encompassing of what it costs the government to operate that airplane, to include the airplane, the fuel, the maintenance, and the manpower. Okay. So, so if those, we've got a so crew chief are, and some airmen that are working on the thing right. and, and putting in oil and et cetera. All right. right. Fair enough. So we didn't really touch on the uh, looks of it, but it is a twin tail uh, with a canted, and it's got kind of an interesting shape for the wings. I don't know what you would call it. It's not like a tri I don't know what I have sunshine my co-host were here. You could tell us, but... It's got a very interesting shape, let's call it that, of the fuselage, but single seat. Yes, and it's blended. And one of the things that it does is uh, as the flight regime changes, mm -hmm. it configures automatically for the flight envelope. No kidding. So, for example, if you're going to take off, there's no flaps to set. There's no leading edge slats. You it don't just, do any of that. It knows you're taking off. Right. It goes, oh, the landing gear's <laughs> down and we're doing zero knots. You must be ready to take off. <laughs> okay. So when you push the throttle up and uh, or throttles up, right. and as you start to roll down the runway, if you were to monitor the flight controls, you'll notice that the leading edge flaps come down, the flap runs come down, and now you take off. Okay. And so it, it knows, okay, you're in the takeoff regime. Sweet. It also changes flight control log rhythms based on landing gear up, landing gear down, and mm. flight Gotcha. As well. So it's very, the flight controls, I'll be honest with you, are fabulous. Yes. Uh, now that I fly an A4 <laughs> for a living, I'm telling you, the, that thing is fabulous. Well, your right arm looks pretty buff, so clearly you're, uh, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're working hard in the uh, A4 now, but all right, fair enough. Armament, always a fun discussion. So let's start with the gun. It yeah. sounds like the same gun as in my F-18. It is. It's a 20 millimeter gun. Okay. Uh, M61A1, I M61 believe. M61A1. Uh, has 480 rounds. All right. And the gun sight and gun system are very accurate. 
Cool. They've been proven over time to work. Excellent. On the F-18, the gun is actually canted up a couple of degrees. Is it that way in the... It is. Yeah. It's a little more than a than a couple of degrees okay. in, the, in the Raptor. Because the idea, it's made for air to air. That's right. So you don't have to pull as much lead. That's correct. Okay. Did you have a chance to employ the gun? I or? did. Numerous okay. times. Oh, excellent. How about air to air weapons? Six AIM-120s and two AIM-9s. All at once can be carried? All at once. Wow. So it's eight air-to-air missiles. And internally, by the way, because all if internal. I carry that in my F-18, I've just doubled my radar cross-section. No, these are all <laughs> internal carriage weapons. All right. All variants of the AIM-120. Okay. And same for the AIM-9. Was there a time that it did not have the AIM-9X? That is a true statement. And it does now? It does now. Okay. And I've always wondered because they talk about the doors will open just for like less than a second. Oh, it, yes. In my F-18, if I'm chasing you and if I am miraculously able to get a tone rise on you, it's because the aircraft is telling me that my AIM-9 sees it. Now, your AIM-9 is tucked up inside. You've got to have some kind of fancy system to transfer, what, a cue to it to know where to go? Or Well, what you do normally is right. you'll swing a door and swing the missile out into the breeze. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. So, but you don't do that until it's a smart time to do it. Ah. So, you will probably want to be outside that guy's radar field of view before you swing a door. Because you've just turned on your you, beacon. You just expose yourself. All right. So, the so, window's rolled down, the dog's sticking his head out. That's and right. sees something it wants to go after, you open the door and, that's right. and send the dog on its way. <laughs> right. All right. So, uh, my the, listeners will tell you I'm the king of awful analogies. So. Well, the other thing I'll talk to you about is mm-hmm. the hydraulic system to support weapons is amazing. It's 4,000 PSI. So when you swing a door, for example, to launch an AMRAM, it's very short period of time. That door swings fast. Mm. The missile's out, it's done, and the door, I mean, it slams shut fast. Because you so I won't don't... give you the exact timing and all of that because <laughs> it really is fast. So yeah. the airplane stays stealthy uh, once it shoots. Okay. Anecdotally, is there ever like... I don't know if you're allowed to answer this, but like if you're ever playing against each other, is like a moment in time where you can kind of see them and then not again? Where... That, that could happen. Okay. That could hypothetically happen. <laughs> and then on. he goes away. <laughs> That's right. All right. And you're like, it's a uh, mirage. How did that happen? So they never bothered, obviously, employing the, or incorporating the AIM-7. That was pretty much a dinosaur by the time. Right. That... Just based on the size of the AIM-7 versus okay. the size of the AMRAM. Okay. And then there's a lot of sexy, I'll call them, missiles that are in other countries. Was there ever any talk about Python, Meteor? There was not. The the 9X and AMRAM were the fundamental. Well, that being said, this aircraft was never either designed or allowed later to be exported. That is correct. And it's because of all the things that we're dancing around. All the capabilities (laughs) that it has. All right. I wonder, I mean, we could sit here and wax poetic uh, on this all day long, but if it had, whether that would have made a difference with it being... Oh, I think it would have made it. I mean, we have really good allies. Mm -hmm. We have foreign exchange pilots flying the F-22. Cool. And after they're done with their tour, they're like, Wish we'd have bought that. Boy, I wish we could have bought this. (laughs) Yeah. In a way, it's great that we've kept this capability to ourselves. But in a way, it hurt us a little bit in that we probably could have sold a whole bunch more, which may have driven the cost down, which may have allowed us, the U.S. Air Force, to buy more. Right. I know that to be the case for the Super Hornet. Every time someone else bought one, we get was, more out of it. That's right. We get more. And sometimes it's the technology. Sometimes it's just other aircraft because of the way the accounting is done. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Air to surface. We've talked about the small diameter bombs. Yes. I think up to a what? 1,000 pound JDAM. That's correct. Okay. But you're not, again, slinging funny stuff in there. Are you doing any kind of JSAL? Not to my knowledge. Could okay. be. I don't know at this time. Maybe that's. Lower- Since I left, it okay. may be able to do that. All right. When I left, we were just getting SDBs, and we were just getting the capability to identify targets, map them, and gotcha. get the coordinates and be able to uh, drop on okay. the coordinates. So, obviously, with your wing stations, which I think are only for fuel tanks, is that right? That's correct. Okay. But so, the, not... so, the SDBs are carried internally as well. Okay. So, if you loaded up SDBs, you would have a mix of air-to-air. It's about a half load of air-to-air okay. and a full load so of So, you SDBs. could self-escort if you needed to. Absolutely. All right. My point was simply, like an F-35 is stealthy, but the Navy versions are, oh, by the way, going to have a bunch of pylons hanging on them, and there could be rockets and harpoons and harms and all the things we've talked about. You right. guys are purists in this regard. For weapons employment, that <laughs> is right. correct. Okay. So you're right. going to be stealthy when you're employing the F-22. Gotcha. Now, performance we talked about, you said 9Gs? 9Gs. Okay. And that's going to, the aircraft is limiting you at that, right? The so, aircraft is limiting okay. you. They could give you a lot more. All right. I'm sure. And what's the highest you've ever had one in altitude? And oh, 60,000 feet in Mach okay. 2. Wow. Those are the Mach limits two. on the airplane for okay. speed there. 
I'll be honest with you, you could be easily way above that. Wow. Oh. And it's if about- If you didn't, didn't yeah. adhere to the limits. It brags about super cruise. And I want to ask you this, Stretch, because like in the F-18, they say, oh, it'll do Mach 1.8. And I scoff because it's like, I got to 1.65 once in a perfectly- naked jet, started at 45,000 feet, got to 1.2 and rolled and pulled. And that was as brave as I was because the earth got bigger. But Super Cruise, let's talk about that. And first off, it's, as I understand it, the ability to go supersonic without being an afterburner. But how much of a big deal is that? I mean, is it like a put it on the flyer at the air show and everybody thinks it's cool? Or was that actually something that mattered to you guys? Oh, it matters. And it's used tactically every day. Really? Air to air wise, the difference between a 0.9 to 0.9 threat mm -hmm. and a 1.5 threat to a 0.9 threat is the timeline goes away. You don't know when to defend. Hmm. So that whole timeline, intercept timeline changes based on that speed. Okay. Other things that speed does, and you talk about super cruising, right. and can you really do super cruising? Mm -hmm. So what you'll do is if you're cruising at 0.9 right. and you want to super cruise and run an intercept, You'll go full afterburner. You'll hit an optimal AOA to accelerate to 1.3 Mach. Uh -huh. You'll climb at 1.3 Mach until you're at the altitude you want to be at. You'll level off, accelerate to 1.5, set it at mil, and it holds 1.5. Wow. You are in the low 40s, high 50s, somewhere between 45 and 60,000 feet, easily running around at 1.5 Mach with the ability to sprint to 1.5 to two wow. if necessary. But you have a procedure there to get you through that transonic time, right. if you will, and then you get to a point where there's some... Right. So learning how to manage your left hand mm. is very important for fuel management. So there's a <laughs> couple of speeds you don't want to be at in a Raptor, okay. or you're going to burn a whole bunch of gas and not gain anything. Gotcha. It. So you don't want to be in that transonic regime very often. You want to be either 0.9, which is really good, good for fuel flow, good for endurance, mm. or 1.2 or faster because you need it tactically. Okay. And the thrust vectoring you talked about before, is that only indirect or can you, is there something in the cockpit that allows you to manually do anything with the thrust vectoring? No, it's incorporated in the flight control okay. system. So once you get a, below a certain speed or angle of attack, it mm -hmm. kicks in. Okay. And then when you get to a higher speed, it also helps in the flight control system. Okay. Yeah, so Maybe just a little differential can give yes. you some roll or yaw or something. Helps you provide stability okay. and control. So again, it's the computers that say, here's what the pilot's asking for. Here's the best way to do it. And exactly. it's just one more flight control. Yeah, almost, it's no different. In a sense. Interesting. All right. So here's the part that I always struggle with because nobody likes to talk about weaknesses with their aircraft. But I think for strengths, we've talked about the super cruise, the maneuverability. I'm trying to remember if I've ever seen an air show demo, but I understand they're pretty amazing. And it has to do with the thrust of weight, the thrust vectoring, the flight controls and all that. But what would you say are some other strengths of the aircraft? Or is there anything strength-wise that maybe I've forgotten to ask you about so far? Well, engines okay. is As a strength. In, Reliability. Reliability. Reliability okay. on the engines is uh, extremely high. <laughs> okay. Right? I'm probably cursing. We're knocking so on wood there's here. probably some yeah. captain that's going to hate me for this <laughs> statement, but the engine reliability has been okay. very good on that. That's a huge plus sure. for a strength. I talked about the flight controls and yeah. their reliability and yeah. what they provide to you. That's good. I think the overall maintainability of the airplane is very high. Huh. If you took the stealth out of it, uh -huh. maintenance out of it, it would actually have a higher mission capable rate than the F-15 and F-16 uh, on a standard day. Uh, but because there's extra time and requirement than that, that drives you lower. That drives that MC yeah, rate down a little bit. Okay. So the reality is, the other thing that I think is a strength is the Air Force has made the investment in the airplane. Every airplane is almost maintained to factory specs every mm. day for <laughs> the stealth. Realistically, those airplanes that we have in the fleet, we, you know, at the junior officer level, we bitch and moan, right? <laughs> There's never enough to fly, right, right? right? But the reality is for combat, we're going to meet all of our taskings. Yeah. And that's really a huge strength in my, my opinion. Well, I will say on a side note that, you know, when you ever go to an air show, the F-15, 16s, 22s, the Air Force birds always look beautiful. And the Navy and Marine Corps birds always look like they just got put back together. And again, I'll, I'll blame the salt air where we spend a lot of our time. And you guys go to Guam and different places, so you got to deal with that too. But yeah, you guys, I think, do a much better job, partly because of the environments you operate in. But yeah, yeah an F-22 probably looks like it, the day it came off the line because that's the way they're maintained. They are maintained very well. Wow. The other thing I think about is strength in the F-22 
if you take it off and you hit a tanker mm -hmm. and you top off, you're now in a stealth configuration and your endurance is equal to a two-bagged eagle that I mm -hmm. used to fly for duration. Right. And so if you take that capability, it gives you a great distance that you can reach out and touch somebody. Wow. And what does it hold internal? 18,000 pounds. 18, phew, dang. And you can put another two drop tanks, right? One now you, that's for ferrying, I guess? For ferry only, you can put okay. up to four drop tanks. Oh, wow. So it's not unusual when we do transland or transpack and ocean crossing mm -hmm. uh, in Air Force terms yeah. that you'll always take those external tanks. But based on the internal fuel, there are times where we'll cross the ocean. We won't have to have the external tanks because we can make the divert if we miss the refueling. <laughs> so it depends that's on the crazy. route you're going and the weather. Yeah, that's crazy. You know, I'm actually glad, Stretch, Which, that you said that because I have a listener question about transpacks, translance, whatever we want to call them, that I've never done one. So when we're done here in a moment, I'm going to come back to that because I'd like you to answer this listener question for me, if you would. All right, weaknesses. If you had unlimited check writing capability or whatever else, what would you have fixed about the F-22, if anything? I would have given it a third SIP. Explain that. It's a third computer. Yeah. CIP? Yeah, CIP. Okay. I would have given it a third one. That would be a weakness <laughs> because when it first came out, uh -huh. they took that third SIP out and they did a whole bunch of uh, reprogramming. Okay. And that space really was needed at the time. And it would have, uh, the airplane would have been uh, FIOC sooner if mm. we'd have had that. Okay. I think this is all opinion, right? All right. So I think that would be one thing I would add. I think another, I don't know if it's a weakness, but if I had the capability to do that, I would give them a helmet, uh, some type of helmet mounted queuing, not just for queuing the AIM-9X, but mm -hmm. integration into the entire situational situation. awareness. Situation awareness. All right. That might help a little bit. Stretch, I have to ask you, I mean, we've been glorying over this aircraft this whole time about the premier air-to-air, -air, maybe the last pure air-to-air -air aircraft. How on earth does it not have a helmet system of some sort? I mean, obviously it has a helmet. Oh, but hey, I can explain it to you very easily. You got to look at the size and the shape of the canopy. There's no room to put it in there and maintain distance between the canopy. For the sensors, you mean? No, for like a joint helmet mount. Oh, really? Yeah, there's not enough room. So if the pilot... So that because the how the canopy is shaped oh my inside. Gosh. Oh, So there's not enough room to put it there. I mean, that really... It, so he'll be banging his head, he or she... Right. Yeah. So that was weighed between oh. the size and the capability. And there's some trade-offs that went with this thing mm -hmm. for capability. Okay. And then there's the... Uh, other part of how much capability does it bring? Do we really need it? Right. So if you've got an airplane that can show up behind somebody and shoot them behind the 3-9 line all the time, <laughs> maybe you don't need a helmet-mounted sight. <laughs> maybe you don't need a high-tech heater first because you can turn so well, you can just gun people. Yeah. So when you weigh that to go on, okay, who should get this capability first? and there's only a limited amount of dollars, well, yeah. maybe those F-15s and F-16s need this capability because they got to be able it to do that. It levels the playing field. A yeah, it levels like this other yeah. guy. He just shows up behind you and thumps you on the head. <laughs> it's like giving the rich kid all the uh, the treats because Th he, right. he can already afford it, sounds like. But anyway, bad analogy. When we had to have something to argue about. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, th there was something. All right. Speaking of the canopy, this was going to come up next in notoriety, although it's not really notoriety. But if you read aviation publications, there was a situation a couple of years ago, I don't remember, where the poor pilot couldn't raise the canopy, couldn't jettison the canopy. Do you remember this? Yes. What was the deal with that? And they had to end up cutting through the canopy, right? Yeah, that's happened once or twice. Oh, dear. To where the airplane at post-flight, right. a guy lands, he could not get the canopy open. Just some sort he didn't of jettison, software? But they didn't jettison it. Oh, but they could have maybe? They could have jettisoned, but oh, they okay. didn't really know what would happen if they jettisoned because the canopy was not working properly. Oh. So they, they made the conservative decision to go, okay, we're just going to cut the pilot out. Here's where we're going to cut. We'll replace the canopy. Okay. We'll get him out. and It'll all be good. How long did that poor bugger sit in there? Six hours. This was clearly not Las Vegas in Woo! July. It was not. Yeah, uh, he was at Langley. Okay. So the one that I remember was at Langley. So the fire department comes out and they get the saws out and they start cutting. And it's not and like he's got can... his helmet down. He's uh, got yeah. everything on to protect himself and leaning away from where right. they're cutting. Golly. But so it's not like they can pass him a sandwich and a glass of water. I mean, he's literally he's, trapped in this bubble. He's trapped there for a oh, while. Man, that's quite a story. Well, I'm glad that. Uh, yeah. I would anyway. not want to be him. 
Well, to go get in it the next time, you have to wonder if the guys think. Yeah, <laughs> like, is this canopy going to work? <laughs> that's right. Oh, that stinks. All right. Well, let's talk about other notoriety. Where has the listener seen the F-22, whether it's in news, uh, in Hollywood, TV shows? Uh, I'm sure it's been out there somewhere. Oh, I think the one, the movie Aloha. Okay. With Emma Stone. I don't think I'm familiar with Bradley that. Cooper. You should watch I it. I should. Those are two big stars. It, it was very interesting to me because I was the vice wing commander at Hickam at the time. All right. And they made the movie there at Hickam. They filmed out in Hawaii. Yeah. Okay. And it was about an F-22 pilot and Bradley Cooper and she's falling in love with him. And it was a great story. Oh, it like, was a good love story. It's like Top Gun. That's yeah, a love story. <laughs> not that good. <laughs> it was not that good. Uh, but, but it was a love story is my point. Yeah. It, but if there is uh, some, there's a couple of good flying scenes in there and there's a couple of good scenes from the uh, O Club there. <laughs> I enjoyed it because I was there. All right. Now, my uh, boss, who was the wing commander at the time, he told me, hey, I'll go do the scenes at the Oak Club. You man the wing. I'm like, okay. Uh, that's right. You got it, Glory Johnny. Hound. You got it. Okay. Rock and Johnny, you Fair got enough. it. Fair <laughs> enough. I don't know if it was in any of the Transformer movies. I want to say it was. I never watched them, so I never know. But I think it was in Iron Man 2 also, and I think... Could have been. I, I you don't, don't know either? I do right. not know. Your kids must be uh, older. Uh, if you have. Anyway, I think Iron Man ends up ripping one piece from piece. Or maybe that was the Hulk. I don't know. I usually get corrected on this. But again, if I didn't see it, uh, uh, no big deal. Does it have, uh, sorry to put you on the spot. I mean, so Vipers, Eagles have got some experience, but they've been around a lot longer. Does it have uh, much air-to-air or air-to-surface um, history, if you will, like actual real-world stuff? Yes. Excellent performance in uh, Syria. Okay. I don't know all the statistics because that happened after okay. my time, but our guys have been doing a really good job over there. Okay. I know a couple of guys who have merged with some Su-35s and they've did very well. So <laughs> I think there's been some capability there and right. I think our guys are, are doing a good they're, job. They're holding their own. Well, they're holding their own. Yeah, fantastic. That's good. Well, speaking of holding their own, is there a particular flight uh, in your experience that sticks out in your mind? Uh, anything either real world-wise employing if you did such things or uh, emergencies. Hopefully you never had to get out of one. I never had to get out of one. There's one story when you were talking about, since you flew Hornets, I'll tell my Hornets story. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it was RIMPAC, I think it was 2013 or 2012. It's always... It an even or odd year. Yeah, right, I don't it's remember It's one of the two. Is. I can't okay. remember it was either. So probably 13, maybe 14. So we're doing this big DCA scenario and uh, all of the red air fell out. So there was a couple of hornets that were on our side. All the red air fell out. All the red air fell out. Looks like so, even years, uh, according to my quick so Google search So that had here. to be... <laughs> 12 or 14, let's yep, go with. Let's go with 14. All right. Anyway, the... Uh, Sorry. So, go okay, well, let's do some dissimilar BFM. So I get paired up with a, uh, a new guy, new pair of dudes in a hornet. Okay. Do you and remember what model? I think it was a super hornet, but I'm okay. not sure. But, but I'm two sure. guys in it? Two guys okay, in it. Okay, so it was an F, most yes, likely. All most right. likely. All right. We, I go, hey, what do you want to do? Um, he goes, well, let's do some BFM. I'm like, okay, we'll do high aspect BFM. So we turn away from each other. Uh, we turn in. Butterfly. Butterfly yep. set, cooperative merge. And I go, hey, I'm just going to hold 18,000 feet, and I'm going to see what happens in here. Uh-huh. Uh, we hit the merge, and his first move is up. And you should have seen the smile on my face. I'm like, hmm. Up, oh, that's good. <laughs> I was expecting a tuck under, trying to get a you know a high off foresight shot against me across the circle. Uh, so I just kind of floated on up, and we merge 180 out, and I just pull just lightly above him, and I merge about 2,000 to 1,500 feet directly over the top, and I'm at 29,000 feet. And he's I could see his jet start to descend a little <laughs> his bit. Wings got some form to him. <laughs> yeah, and then I'm directly over the top. I go 180 out. 1,500 feet away, and I go full aft stick maneuvering. So I go 180 out, 90 degrees a second because of the pitch trim, pitch <sighs> rate, and I'm parked at his six for 1,500 feet right behind him. Mm. What the important part of that is that validated all my maneuvering discussion that we've had earlier, mm-hmm. then that had nothing to do with my skills. <laughs> you know, so after that set, where I'm like, okay, that was over pretty quick. I go, okay, we'll just do offensive sets. For him. For him. Right. So that was the, you know, where you see, and when you're looking backwards and you see the line of sight rate pulling forward, and you're going, I'm still tracking. I'll just keep pulling him forward. You know, from a mile set, you really do merge one either. I think that's what happened to me, Northern Edge. Yeah. And then then it's a rate fight from there. And Uh then, you know, and then it goes. So that validated all those maneuvering, (laughs) you know, discussions. Did you get a chance to debrief with him? We didn't. He had to go back and 
he had to land. Oh, I mean, he's on the ship. He was oh, off the ship. Okay. Yeah. All right. Too so bad. Because that can be, uh, you know, I've yep. been in that position, particularly when I was younger, even, even yep. when I was more seasoned. <laughs> and that's, yep. you know, you're coming back with your tail between your legs. But to your point, it was good that's aircraft, aircraft. I mean, right. if you'd have been in the Hornet and he'd have been in the uh, that Wouldn't Raptor, have changed. Could have, been, could have been a different situation. Wouldn't yeah. change. So that, that goes into that. What that airplane is designed to do, yeah. it can do. The performance matches the glossary brochure on the jet. <laughs> I wish I had a chance to find it. I don't think the outcome would have been much different, but it would have been eye-watering to see that, I'm sure. So I do want to ask you, by the way, this listener question. I told you I was going to come back to it. Before I do, while I'm looking for it, did you deploy in this aircraft? Yes. Did you do anything yeah. worth uh, hinting at? Not into a combat operation. Kinetic? Yeah. All right. But numerous TDY locations, okay. uh, Kadena, Japan, Guam. Uh, we went from Hawaii to Tyndall, so that was a you know, long flight, you know, yeah. you know, well, 10 or 12 hours. Thank you for that segue, because here's my question from Gus from Sacramento, California. He says, I recently heard the 810 Warthog podcast, and in it you mentioned long parentheses relocation flights. My question is, if the Warthog is not so great at this, what would be the best fighter to do long flight in and why? I think people with limited knowledge of fighters and whom have only ever flown in commercial planes would get a kick out of knowing the differences. So there's a couple follow-on questions to this, and I can come back and remind you if you want. Uh, he says, what's typical? What's the longest flight? How long does it take compared to commercial flights? Were there stops along the way? So at any rate, let's go back to the beginning. Now, I never did this. My longest flight was a little over six hours. But man, I don't know, Stretch. I have to think the answer is no airplane is the best one because that's a fact. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sitting they're, still. They're all the same. Okay. <laughs> they're all the same. But to his point, if you're at 15,000 feet and 200 knots, that just feels more painful. You've done a couple of these? I've said? done a lot of them. What was the longest at least you ever 10, did? 10, I think. 10? 10 ocean crosses at least. Holy cow. What was yeah. the longest you ever spent in an F 22 cockpit? Oh, or, well, or oh, an F 22, but... about nine hours. Okay. Well, how about an nine. Eagle? 12 and a half. How? Well, <laughs> You go into the wind, that's 200 knots. No, no, no. I mean, your rear end. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you, yeah, you're going to be tired when you get there. And you're wearing right. an exposure suit, most oh, likely. Oh, my gosh, because you're over the cold ocean. That's right. So, yeah, you, you build your nest and you get comfortable. You take your lunch with you. A couple, I would hope. Yeah. And, and some you know, Gatorade bottles. And... You know, simple things. I, I usually, for example, I would plan a liter of water for every two hours. Okay. I would take pedal packs. You know, doing a lot of fluid exchange, right? <laughs> because staying hydrated was probably the most important right. part of this thing. Right. Um, and staying awake. Yeah, staying awake. It's probably uh, second, and then staying nourished. That's correct. Okay. But the water is more is the most important. Oh, yeah. Staying hydrated yeah. was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to be careful what you ate to the night prior. Oh, yes. So no being spicy. biologically correct before you launched <laughs> was important, and taking that extra five minutes okay. was good. So, is there an airplane that's better at it than others? You know, I think it doesn't really matter. It's just going to take you some time. Let me ask you this. So, How would you compare the F-15 and the F-22's seating, like comfort-wise? Because the F-15 is like a Hornet with a center stick, right? Yeah. F-22 is like an F-16 uh, over to the side stick to the right. Was one more comfortable than the other? I felt like both were about the same. Okay. And, you know, I got used to both. Sure. And once you get used to it, it's yeah, fine. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the Eagle had just a little bit more room than the F-22. All right. But... Overall, they were both pretty comfortable. All right, there. so I'll remind you the rest of these, and we'll do like a lightning round. Uh, what's typical? I think by this he means oh, time. So typical time. I would say nine to eleven hours. Okay. On an ocean crossing, and that was going to get you basically halfway around the world. Wow. So our guys that went left from Alaska and they deployed over to Lake and Heath, mm -hmm. they went over the pole, and it wow. was nine and a half hours. What if they have a problem? They land somewhere up. So around... so every refueling. Right. This right. is another misconception, probably <laughs> that most, I would say, some naval aviators may it may have a misconception. I of. clearly do. <laughs> Every time you refuel, you have a missed refueling base if you can't refuel. Okay. So as you're going across, mm -hmm. you may be only use two thousand pounds of gas, and you get back on the boom and get some more gas. Okay. So you always have a divert option. Which we do actually in my airline I'm capacity as well. Oh, yes. It might take you two or three hours to get there, depending on but the But you still got to get okay. divert. Uh, what's the longest flight you've heard of? It doesn't have to be you necessarily. Eagles from Eglin going to Tabuk in Desert Storm. 14 and a half hours or 15 hours. <laughs> Were they able to walk when they got out? <laughs> Apparently so. They, they oh, did man. very well in Desert wow. Storm. So yeah, it was a 58th sure. fighter squadron and 
I think they were pretty tired when they got there. Though. Okay, outstanding. Uh, let's see. How long does it take compared to commercial flights? I can take a stab at this one. I'm guessing you guys are cruising about the same altitudes and airspeeds, right? So. We're actually, well, you, for example, you, you need a, uh, an altitude reservation. So you need okay. a block altitude for multiple jets right. in a cell. And so typically, if I were F-15, F-22, you're in the high 20s. Oh. If you are probably an A-10, based on their ability to refuel, mm -hmm. you're probably in the high teens to low 20s right. at the most, yeah. I would think. That's what Supa said, as I recall. Yeah. Okay. Speed-wise, like cruising around 0.8, right? I mean, you're with a uh, tanker. Pretty much 0 0.8, 310 knots for refueling. Okay. And then you'll accelerate to about 350 cal. And how often are you refueling? Depends. Usually what we do is we'll take off, and as soon as we rejoin, get in the block, we'll do boom checks. Okay. So we'll make sure our systems are good. So right. we'll cycle everybody across mm -hmm. and make sure all the systems are good. And if they're all good, then we're going to go ahead and start pressing. Right. There's a flight plan we're supposed to follow, and we get on at exact points. And it's okay. based upon, okay, number one is supposed to get on at this point in time. Number two, at this point in time, follow the flight plan. Right. Well, so I'm so shocked, Stretch, because I would have thought, oh, no, just get airborne and go. Well, of course, it's going to be planned out with yeah. fuel. We, actually, the Air Force has an entire squadron dedicated to aircraft movements. Is that right? <laughs> yes. And they're pros at it. Okay. You go, okay, what's your airplane? And they're going, here's where you're going to you go. go. They okay. plan the whole thing, and they show up. Yeah. They yeah. actually take over, take on of the operation until they get you from point A to oh, point B. Okay. Yeah. And this is where terminology matters because when you say the word squadron, you really mean like an organization of people. Yes. When I think of a squadron, I think of a no kidding organization of aircraft and pilots and all that. But this is right. these are guys that are kind of doing the number crunching for That's you correct. in an office. Okay, right. fair enough. All right, back to Gus's question. Uh, were there stops along the way? Yes, so you can do that. You can leapfrog kind of? You could leapfrog. Mm -hmm. Now, Air Force was in the F-22, F-15, you would... Typically, stopping, like if you're going to the desert or the Middle East, mm -hmm. you'll stop in Europe for 48 hours and then you'll flow in. Uh, okay. It helps you acclimate mm -hmm. and uh, maintenance gets a chance to do servicing on the jet. Gotcha. Now, if it has to be there, we'll just keep sure. on going. Do what we got to do. But if we can give, right. like you said, the maintainers a chance to check the hydraulics and everything right. else and all the oils and low yeah. levels, yes. Okay. Now, if you want to do it in a honey badger in an L-159, or an A4 from Europe to <laughs> there, we've done it as well. So, we've, you know, for Draken, we've actually supported the Dutch Air Force and we wow. took off out of here. Mm -hmm. We went through Nova Scotia, Canada, Narsasarak in Greenland, Keflavik, Iceland, Preswick, Scotland, into uh, Leeuwarden. We're going to have a whole separate episode on this, but when you're going between Greenland and Iceland on a, in a single engine airplane, how's that feeling? You don't look down. <laughs> Anyway, all right, all right, real quick, let's wrap it up with Gus here. Any funny stories, any horror stories? You have someone who's supposed to like keep everyone awake and tell jokes, right? Like the oh, junior guy? Yes, okay, so there are assignments. Okay. So number one is leading the overall mission, and then he will just make assignments. And one of the guys in the information is the joke guy. Okay. He goes, you make sure that you have a joke for all the way. Every, you know, so often. Keep everybody so, awake. Keeping everybody is, awake. Is it like, does it actually so, have to be funny? Because that can get difficult after a while. Or if it's well, like an awful pun. Typically, he'll bring a joke book. All right. Some guys will uh, bring music they'll listen to. Uh -huh. I can't confirm this. I've heard that some guys will bring things. They'll watch a movie while they're en route. I haven't done that. I will confess, when I used to deliver <laughs> aircraft from the depot in San Diego to different squadrons on the East Coast, I'd bring a newspaper. And it was like 1941 up there because I'd have the thing, you know, spread out. And it's like, I can't see anything but the newspaper. But I wouldn't allow myself more than about a sentence or two when I would right. pull the thing away, look down. And, of course, we have audible alerts and stuff. But now with you guys, though, I was always on my own. Do you have, like, your own little altitude reservation that you can set the autopilot on? And then if you drift under somebody? Uh, this is not autopilot on. No? I don't remember turning the autopilot on because wow. you're in formation. Right. But not like Blue Angel Thunderbird No, not formation. Blue Angel. I mean, yeah, unless the weather's bad. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Right. Then you're in tight. And inevitably, you're going to hit some of that you've on got, a 12-hour flight. Right. All right. Fair enough. And you're Any, probably going to uh, take off. It's going to be dark when you take off, and it's going to be right in the weather. Oh, geez. Always. Yeah. All right. Maintenance issues? Any horror stories Gus wants to know? Or even stomach <laughs> oh, <laughs> issues? There's been some code browns from dudes oh, en route. but. Most of the ocean crossings go good. pretty straightforward, and maintenance does a real ju good job yeah. of prepping the jets because right. they know they're going to be on a long flight. So yeah. all the servicing is double-checked. Right. Everything's done right. So it's before you go, it's good. 
Well, and tying this back to our subject of the day, I mean, most F-22s are not that old, right? I mean, when were these things made? Between 2005 and 2012-ish, 13. Okay. Compared to an F-15C, which was probably last made? The newest F-15C is an 86 model. <laughs> All right. So we have some benefit of modern and recent technology here yes. with F-22. Well, thank you for answering that on behalf of Gus. I couldn't have well, Gus, done that. hopefully I answered it. I think so. So we'll see if he sticks around and, uh, and writes us back. Stretch, this has been a lot of fun. I say it almost every episode. We could go on and on, not just on everything you know about, but the F-22. Uh, what did I miss? What does the lay person either get wrong or not ask that they should ask? What else about the F-22? And, and again, I'm sure there's a lot, but anything specific that people just need to know that we didn't cover today? I'm a huge fan of the F-22, and I'm so thankful I got to fly it. Mm. I think it was, it was very expensive to bring it online, but in the modern world, with all the threats that are out there today, it has really proven its worth. So that's what I would say to the average person. I go, I think it's, it's expensive, but I think it's worth it. Yeah. And all that technology that we built into that truly saves lives every day. Well, and that's what I was just formulating a mental thought about saying, which is, you know, in this profession of arms, it is expensive, both in dollars and in blood. Yes. And it's not to be taken lightly. And I hope that we have, if there are listeners who are concerned about their taxpayer dollars, assuage that a little bit because with 181 Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptors, sounds like they've gotten their money's worth. I think so. And I think it also keeps our potential enemies at bay as well, because mm. I think they know. Which again... Which so saves lives that's in, right. in the long run. That's right. Stretch, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, before we let you go, we got a couple of final questions. What's the future hold for you? Sounds like you've got yourself pretty well set up. I think uh, I'm very happy with the company I'm working for, okay. Draken. I plan to keep flying for as long as I possibly can, because <laughs> flying fighters is fun. It's a good time. How and, many uh, hours do you have? Let's see here. <laughs> 3,500 in the Eagle, 400 in the Raptor, probably. Call it four. Yeah, so that's four, plus another 1,500 at Draken, split between the L159 55, and A4. So don't 55. forget a couple hundred in training. So getting on six and yeah. in fast maneuvering airplanes. Six, probably close to 5,500, 6,000 in fighters, oh. and then probably another 3,000 hours civilian wow. time. And you're still out there getting it done. And what are you pulling, by the way, Dave? I mean, how's your neck, for heaven's sakes? Oh, I've got a pinched nerve in my neck. <laughs> <laughs> my neck's a mess. But you're still, you're going to fly tomorrow, right? I am, uh, twice tomorrow. Seven Gs or something? Well, it won't uh, be seven, okay. but it'll probably be four to five tomorrow. Right. Well, that's not too bad. Yeah. That's gentlemen. I plan to win. I don't want to pull a seven. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, this has been great. I can't let you go. The listeners are addicted now. At least I am. I don't know if they care or not, but we always ask everyone at the end, how did someone come up with a call sign stretch oh for gosh. Terry Scott? Well, first assignment at Eglin Air Force Base. I'll tell the clean version. Thank you. So I don't know how it happened, but I was a brand new lieutenant in the squadron, second lieutenant. All right. And I had a white t-shirt on. I had a scarf on because that's what they told me I should wear. Uh, you fell so, for that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> and I'm in the bar, and I'm having a beer, and my buddy, who we became great friends with, Alex Ulrich, walks in, Axe. And Axe is this big dude. I'm a big guy. I'm five foot six, you know, <laughs> maybe. And I, I lie, I'm five seven, but really I'm five six. <laughs> he walks in the squadron bar, and he's been out golfing all day. Okay. He's got his fighting crow shirt on. It's an extra large. He's covered in sweat. He takes off his shirt. He throws it at me across the bar. It hits me in the face. And he goes, stretch, put that on. And I've been stretch ever since. <laughs> I well, won't talk about the lady at the old club. Uh, okay. The young lady at the old club. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. And the good thing is, you never later did anything either sufficiently bad enough or got caught doing sufficiently something buffoonerous enough that something else. To get renamed. <laughs> That's right. Emergency renaming. It did not happen. Thank goodness. Oh, dear. Stretch, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for your time today. I forgot to ask at the beginning, how many years of service? 33. Did you start enlisted? I did. I was enlisted seven years, and then I was an officer for 26. Uh, yeah. If you said that, I was already thinking about the interview, and I missed yeah. it. 33 yeah. years, of, buddy. So. Thank you for your 33 years of service to our nation and to the Air Force. This has been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. And if 
Past performance is any indication of future expectations. Here's what I predict. Get Stretch back on the show. I don't care what he talks about. Get him back because I hear that all the time. And you definitely seem to have fit the mold. And if I can't find someone else, and I'm sure I can, but maybe you can even come and like co-host an Eagle episode. But I've yet to have anyone come back and do a second subject. But I'd be happy to do it. Awesome. Love to, Jello. Thanks. It's been a great time. Great. Thanks very much. And uh, let's get out of here. Sounds great. Thanks. All right, man, that was amazing. Big thanks again to Stretch for taking the time out of his busy schedule to pick me up at the airport and record the interview there in Las Vegas. Man, I thought that was an awesome discussion, Chip. What did you think? Yeah, <laughs> that's cool, man. He's got a great career, great experience in the airplane and really did a nice job explaining a lot of the nuance of what it's like to be in that fifth gen machine and now operating overseas too with that mm-hmm. uh, and the things he and his fellow Raptor community is seeing. It's, it's really cool. He did a great job with those explanations really need to listen to. Yeah, no doubt. I did a little research on that movie Aloha afterwards, and it didn't fare too well on Rotten Tomatoes. I think it was only <laughs> about a 20%, but man, it had some big stars in it. It had Bill Murray and all kinds of folks, but anyway, yeah, you win some, you lose some. Hey, so... Uh, That's funny. Yeah, 3,500 hours in the F-15. Good grief. He's definitely going to have to be our guest co-host for the Eagle episode. Yeah, that's a no-brainer right there. Yep, for sure. Although he might steal the show, but anyway, hey, so let's clean up a couple loose ends. Yeah. Um, first off, he said something about merging with SU-35 flankers out around Syria. Now, so there's not like aerial engagements happening that we're not hearing about on the news, right? I mean, obviously these guys aren't, they're not going kinetic, obviously. Yeah, no, that's not the case. And I think what he's talking about is it turns out, and I think even most of our listeners may be aware of this. If not, you can go back and take a look. It turns out that that battle space that they were operating in was really congested. A mm. lot of coordination was going on. And the, the reality too, is there was actually a lot of risk, you know, one wrong move in one wrong direction and, you know, misunderstanding what's happening or maybe a slight deviation from your normal flight path might set off some concerns. There was a lot of airplanes and a lot of movement in a relatively small three-dimensional space that created a lot of risk. And I think there was a lot of close interactions with what we would normally deem as as threatening aircraft that were trying to figure out a way to operate in the same place. And that was a real challenge. Uh, My biggest takeaway is listening to him talk about it, knowing a little bit of what's going on, obviously not out there doing it, is how high the awareness was for the Raptor pilots and how high the SA was and how much they knew was going on and how massive that awareness was as a contributor to the rest of the people in the battle space. Yeah. Having them there was a massive force multiplier, even if what they were doing wasn't a kinetic and their biggest contribution, albeit they had some kinetic contributions, the biggest contribution for that machine out there was the level of awareness and the uh, positional advantage they had by knowing what was going on and retaining that awareness and spreading it out with the people, uh, to the people out there with them was a huge advantage. And the Raptor community uh, built a great reputation as a force multiplier just through that alone, among other things. It's pretty neat. That is an interesting point because it reminds me of, say, the Blue Angels, right? Where everybody goes to the air show and what they see is the six pilots and just the airplanes and they think, oh, that's cool. But man, behind the scenes is all this other effort, the maintenance and the logistics and everything. And so what you just said is a lot of more like the maintenance and the behind the scenes guys of what the F-22 is doing. Still vitally important, but maybe not quite as headline making, huh? Yeah, it's certainly not as dramatic uh, as dropping a bomb or shooting down an airplane. I mean, those are going to be headline news events. I always have said this is that the Raptor is the most impressive performing machine in the world. And the least impressive thing about the Raptor is how well it performs. The kinetic (laughs) maneuvering of that airplane, you know, Uh speed, G, all that sort of stuff, all the things that you guys talked about, Mm -hmm. as impressive as that is, that's the least impressive thing about the jet. And I think most Raptor pilots would agree is that as incredible as that machine is, where the real magic is on the inside, not what you see on the outside. Oh, that's pretty deep, actually. You could almost say that about people and everything else, but let's not go go. too big a tangent. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So help me with some terminology. One thing you said early on that uh, we didn't explain was the term vol. What is a vol? Yeah. So I think what he's talking about is what we refer to as a vulnerability window, a vol. It's really just a time frame under which, in this case, the Raptors, and it doesn't have to be F-22, any airplane, has responsibility for supporting the other aircraft and the missions going on during that window. And so sometimes we conduct 24-hour operations and we do it forever. If you remember kind of the old Operation Southern Watch, uh, we essentially had aircraft airborne pretty much all the time. And we break them down in, into, you know, smaller categories and, you know, eagles would fly and vipers would fly and hornets and they would cover these different windows. When we talk about a vulnerability window or a vol window, that's the time frame which they say, hey, you know, from 
time period, you know, 0030 to time 00, you know, 0100. So for that 30 minute window, we've got all these different things going on. We're going to have strikers here, intelligence aircraft here, ISR platforms here, whatever that might be. Right. And our particular mission during that window might be strike or might be whatever it is. The Raptors are there during that window protecting other aircraft as an air dominance fighter you know, partially kinetically, but also just through the situational awareness. That's that time frame under which they are responsible for protecting Mm -hmm. or providing whatever support they are there to provide during that time frame. And that's, you know, a detailed coordination and a pretty aggressive plan to to build that. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to do it, you know, 24-7, 365, but we will have these windows at which we're all going to be out there performing our missions. And the Raptors play a huge role in those uh, vol windows. Right. And the point is, is that vol window can be something real world operations or it can be in training. Absolutely. If we know that we're going out on a morning training evolution up at Northern Edge, then the vol, like you said, could be for a 30 minute period or whatever. I think kind of like, you know, in a football game, when you watch it on television, when the clock is actually ticking, right? When the plays are happening. So if you've got the running back out on the field making a play, that is part of the period of the game or in, in our case, the vol. So That's a cool right. analogy. Yeah, that's great. It's the time in which we're actually doing the real show there in combat or, Mm -hmm. you know, like you said, in training too. And obviously we practice that in training all the time. So when it happens in the real world, we're familiar with showing up on time, showing up ready to go, being there before the vol window starts, coordinating your back and forth to make sure you've got that entire period covered with all your assets there. Okay. Now, another thing he said was that there are O-1s flying the Raptor. And just just to clarify on that, of course, uh, an O-1 is the first rank you have as an officer, and yeah. E-1 is the first rank as enlisted. And so I think the point he was simply making there was you have brand new officers just fresh out of flight school that are flying this thing, right? So uh, you and I understood that, but a lot of times the guests don't always get it. So we'll explain that briefly. And then he deliberately let me flounder a bit when it came to describing <laughs> some of the various low signature characteristics of the f 22 So I don't know. You had a chance to listen to me and his response. I mean, is there anything more really that we can say or needs to be said? No. And I kind of chuckled because Stretch's response was very similar to kind of at least what I was thinking in the back of my mind. You know, the biggest takeaway, and there's probably something worth mentioning in both of those, the idea that you've got O1s or second lieutenants flying the F-22 speaks volumes to how well trained our pilots are and how easy Mm -hmm. these airplanes actually are to fly. You know, being a second lieutenant or, or an ensign flying a fighter used to almost be just simply not possible. And when we first started training in the Raptor, we believed that only transition guys that had previous fighter experience were going to be capable of flying this airplane. And he made a comment. He said, those O1s and O2s, you know, second and first lieutenants, not only are they flying them, they're really, really good. Mm. Uh, And that's pretty cool to see that. And then, you know, kind of that was segue to the other piece of, you know, the thing about stealth is probably the biggest takeaway I had in listening to, to the conversation and the comments that I heard you guys both make. And obviously with, with Stretch's experience, the way he let you kind of go down that road a little bit. The thing that I would I would add to that is that stealth isn't a magic button. You know, it's not the Wonder Woman jet where you just press a button and you become invisible. <laughs> it's a weapon system, and it's a system yeah. that goes along with all the other systems on the aircraft that the pilot needs to manage all the time in order to preserve a real big capability, a big advantage that we have. It doesn't solve all your problems magically. It's not a just on and off switch that if it's on, you're just invisible to everybody. It's it's a, something you have to manage. And, but stealth is a massive force multiplier, and pilots and flying and stealth airplanes have to learn how these systems work and how effective they are and where they work and where they could be managed. And obviously we don't talk in a lot of detail on that and for obvious reasons, but keep in mind too, what self-pilots understand is, like I said, it's not magic. Uh, It's a system that we have to manage like everything else. Gotcha. And also afterwards, I couldn't find any references to F-22s and JSAL. Was that ever anything that came up during your time? Yeah, no, no JSAL in the F-22. That makes that easy. All right, let's see. Gosh, uh, obviously uh, a lot of discussion on ocean crossings. Did you ever do an ocean crossing in F-18? Uh, yeah, I did in a Hornet. So obviously I did a bunch of carrier time, but I also did a transpac on something we called a UDP or a Western Pacific okay. deployment to Japan. So I flew from San Diego to Japan and back. You talk about some more blue water ops, you know, the, mm-hmm. those flights, I know what that's like as well. So, okay. uh, and topping off in the tanker, all those things he described there. Uh, I'm familiar with that as well. (laughs) Gotcha. All right. That was pretty cool. I mean, that was great. I think we covered it all. Anything else that didn't come out that you think the listener might find interesting or valuable for the F-22 Raptor? Yeah, I don't know if you wanted to cover it. The only other thing that he had mentioned was a term that I kind of laughed at, He because I'm familiar with it, is the term AHC. Advanced Handling Characteristics? Yeah. And when I was growing up in the Navy and the Marine Corps, we called it a 1v0. 
if you ever hear those terms, you know, 1v0 was us in our airplanes going out by ourselves, kind of exploring the limits of the aircraft itself. And so I wouldn't have an opponent I was flying against. It was just me in my jet and Jello would give me a card and say, Chip, I want you to go out and do a rolling scissors or a brake turn or a high OA, whatever it might be, you know, a, a reversal, something like that. And that's just me exploring the maximum performance characteristics of my jet. It's pretty synonymous, those two terms, AHC is the same thing as a 1v0 in the Navy Marine Corps. I had to learn that when I did all my time with the Air Force is doing the, I had a little translation guide in my own mind uh, of what Matt want. But AHC for the Air Force is the same thing that you and I did uh, in the Hornet back in the day in the 1v0 phase. And it was always fun because, of course, fighter pilots never miss an opportunity to rib each other if they can. So when someone comes back from a 1v0, you'd always say, did you win? Did you lose? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you lost, right? The refly in the 1v0 can be tough sometimes. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. All right, Chip. Well, that was awesome. Thanks for adding a little extra information there on the F-22. I think we can wrap this up then. We always like to remind the listeners that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Chip, I want to thank you for coming back to the show and helping us out as guest co-host today. Really appreciate all the additional information. Yeah, man. Look, talking about the Raptor is something I can pretty much do anytime you want. Perfect. How many hours did you end up with in it? Oh, man, that's a good question. Probably three or 400 hours, uh, oh, maybe wow. 300 hours. It wasn't a ton, you know, by Hornet standards, but at the time that mm-hmm. was, that was a lot. I flew for the three years at the four two. I flew a lot of flight time there. It was a lot of, fun. Oh, I bet. And you were just right there in Vegas, man. That must've been a good tour. It was awesome. All right, Chip. Well, thanks for stopping by for the listeners. Don't forget to stick around after the closing bumper and flyby for a special message. Otherwise that'll do it for this episode. Chip, thanks for swinging by, man. Thanks, man. All right, guys. We'll see ya. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thank you for listening. All right, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. As you know, our usual co-host Sunshine was tied up and unable to join us last month, but he's back and with an announcement. So what's going on, Sunshine? Hello, Jello. Hey, man. It's great to be back. But uh, I know you and I have already discussed this, so this is more for the listeners out there. I just want to give you a heads up that my day job, the requirements have gone way up, and which it's kind of bittersweet, right? So it's great that the fleet needs more of uh, the stuff that we do, the training and all that. But unfortunately, the casualty is going to be I need to step back from Fighter Pilot Podcast and BVR Productions as a whole. So sincerely apologize, but I uh, just wanted to put that out to all the listeners. Uh, no worries, man. We have really enjoyed having you on the show. I know I speak for the listeners when I say that we've learned a lot from you. We've been entertained and educated. And, you know, I knew a day like this would come. I've certainly enjoyed the time we've had together. It's been, gosh, I don't know, at least, what, a year almost that we've been doing these together. And I... Certainly am appreciative of your time, and I learned a lot, like I said, and uh, just appreciate you letting us know, and thanks and best wishes to you, my friend. Yeah, thanks, brother. So, yeah, I guess uh, it was almost two years ago that you and I did that inaugural episode, right, of what is a fighter pilot, and then you were nice enough to let me join for the co-host about a year ago, and Mm -hmm. uh, my mantra kind of through my career has always been to entertain and inform the audience, and I think you and the podcast there, or uh, we really, I guess, right? have been doing a fantastic job. And when it comes to informing, I do feel that the interviewees and the listeners themselves have informed me and educated me more than I could ever pay back. So just want to thank everyone for that. Cool. All right, man. Well, hey, I'll give you one final chance here. What do we always say? Let's get out of here.